Good evening, good morning, hello church family. I'm sitting here with St. Paul, or at least a painting of St. Paul from the 17th century. It's good to be with him though, and he's busy writing, that's why he's ignoring me while I try and talk to him, and try and stick my finger in his ear and stuff, but he ignores me all the time. We continue with our study of Romans, written by St. Paul, and we're on chapter 14, going from chapter 14 verse 1 to chapter 15 verse 7, and uh, so far we've We've studied uh, from chapter 4, I think we started chapter 4 or 5, and uh, brought ourselves all this way. Sometimes this kind of Bible study is a little bit long-winded because we're going through sort of verse by verse, and sometimes I'll do some verses and then rush through a few other verses. Like today, I think I'm going to focus a bit more on the beginning of chapter 14 and then just sort of uh, go a bit faster towards the end of 15 verse 7. And what we're getting is an outline of the book of Romans, uh, the letter to the Romans, uh, hopefully understanding something about what it means and also bringing that home to ourselves a little bit in this time. And I hope this is going to be helpful to you as it is to me. I've really enjoyed studying the book of Romans, although sometimes it's been a bit of a hard slog. Um, it's been helpful just to re revise because often you read um, say, a passage here and there from a book, and you end up having this idea that this specific passage or this specific verse means something that you realize doesn't mean what it means when you read it more closely. So I'm hoping this is helpful, and it's good to connect with you in this strange way. Uh, I haven't done Google Meets or Zoom meetings because I just find that way too stressful that we uh, suddenly get disconnected halfway through a Bible study or something. So I always encourage you to uh, reach out to me, angus at tvmethodist.co.za or give me a call on my phone number 061-156-9336 or even just have a, a Google Meet or a, or a Zoom call or a Skype or however you prefer to connect. There's so many different ways. Yesterday we heard the good news that we're going down to level one from the 21st of September. Um, not entirely sure what that means as far as the policy of the church goes. We're going to have a meeting on the uh, on Saturday, where we have training for, for COVID reopening, and we are looking at the various protocols that need to be in place. We bought one of those uh, thermometers that you can infrared your forehead or your, or your wrist with and get your body temperature. We'll have to put those sanitizers in place, and we'll have to see what happens about whether we're allowed to sing or not allowed to sing. And all those things, we're going to talk about that this coming Saturday. I would encourage you to install the COVID app that's, uh, that the president spoke of in his address the other day. So if you go to your app store in, uh, in Google Apps or in, um, or in uh, what's the other one? Place, uh, Mac things. Anyways, it's COVID alert SA. I'm going to try and, I know this is a, uh, it's somewhere there. Can you see it? COVID alert. It's coming out green because I'm in front of a green screen. Um, COVID alert ZA, and that's going to be helpful. And uh, it tells me that I haven't been exposed to anybody with coronavirus recently. No exposures found. That's good news. Um, but that will be a very helpful thing in terms of us reopening church, in that anybody who's running that app on their phone, if you're in touch with somebody who's got COVID, you'll be alerted and you'll uh, know whether you need to isolate yourself if you're with that person for a significant amount of time or get yourself tested. Um, so please install that app on your phone. I think that's going to be key to us being able to have safe services and also be able to let people know whether they've uh, been exposed to somebody with COVID. Perhaps if we're all at that one church service and there were 50 of us there um, and somebody tested positive, we'd all get a notification and know what precautions we need to take. But it's looking really good for South Africa, and for those who have been praying and those who keep praying, our prayers are being answered. I would say that South Africa has really managed the COVID crisis well. There is a possibility of resurgence of it, but we know what to do, and the lockdowns and testing and tracing, and I think we've got our hands on it. So we look forward to the recovery that's coming ahead. But let's uh, continue as we read Romans chapter 14, verse 1 to 15, verse 7. And before we do that, we pray. Loving God, thank you so much for the opportunity to study the Scripture in this new technological way. Thank you for all that we've learned about ourselves and about life during this time of lockdown. And thank you for the progress that we're making as a country. 
as we mourn each and every one of those more than 15,000 people who have passed due to COVID. We thank you for the for those who have recovered and for the hard work that's gone into making sure that everybody survived. Lord, we thank you for for the way that we have shown that we truly do value life. And we ask that that valuing of life would continue into our world as we don't only care for those who are sick in in body, but we also try to heal those social problems that cause violence and murder and, and all sorts of terrible things to happen. We pray against the poverty and the division in our land, especially as we read Romans chapter 14, uh, which deals with divisions. We pray that you'd help us to have more unity in thought and in, in our working out of life together. So be with us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So we continue. Romans chapter 14, verses uh, 1 to chapter 15, verse 7. And now we um, just uh, I've sort of changed the way I, I lay out my, my, my things. I'm going to share, you <coughs> share a picture with you too of my whole little setup I've got in my cupboard, in my lounge now, where I do my recordings. But I'm not in the cupboard, I'm outside of the cupboard. But uh, Romans chapter 14 and just a revision, quick as possible without me talking too much, we go through from uh, what we've read so far. So, in chapter 1, we didn't do that, but uh, God's righteousness is explained, and the righteousness of God's wrath is explained, that, that God has every right to be angry with people. But then we talk about, in Romans, God's dealings with Abraham, and how Abraham, through faith, was saved. And then we started, yes, we started in chapter 5, boasting in our hope of sharing the glory of God. So, from chapter 1 to 4, Paul outlines this fallenness of humanity and then from chapter 5 he talks about how we can have this hope of being restored into God's image and so we remember very well all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God the short the glory of God that we've fallen short of is the fact that God created us in his image to bear his likeness to reflect his glory and his love and his personality into the world but we messed up through sin so God justifies our unrighteousness in the death of Jesus. The, the, the consequences of the brokenness of ourselves is taken over through Christ's death and resurrection. Then he deals with the problem of the law and sin, reminding us that, that sin is exposed through the law, but the law is not the solution to sin. And then the possibility and the hope that we have of, of, of life in the Spirit which assures us of God's love, but also transforms us inwardly and outwardly outwardly to become the people that God has called and created us to be. So we are, we are people who experience the love of God poured out into our hearts and souls, into our, into our lives, but we're not just that, we also are transformed. So the assurance of God's love, and then, uh, let me just fix something here, from chapters 9 through to 11, Paul speaks about the, the problem that's exposed. Uh, Israel is the chosen nation or this chosen chosen community, but how come Gentiles are being included now? And this is the, the, big, the big complication for, for everybody. All the questions that they want to ask is, is how can Gentiles suddenly be allowed to become Jews? And how can they be allowed to become Jews without being circumcised, without partaking in the kosher? regulations without observing the various days etc so paul has to go through from chapters 9 to 11 all about why god is still fair in choosing to allow gentiles to be part of his family uh, maybe it seems obvious that god can choose what god would choose but there there is an issue there and it was some issue in that church at the time um, and so a reminder that god is still impartial and still faithful and still promises to redeem Israel. So God is merciful in, in, in electing Israel. And that's important for us to realize that chapters 9 to 11 are kind of this, this uh, side, side note that Paul is dealing with all of these complications um, that arise. So if you were to read Romans, it might make sense, I mean read the whole lot together, but you jump from chapter 8 to, ju to chapter 12, you kind of um, 
see that chapters 9 to 11 are kind of parentheses. Chapter 8, speaking about the work of the Holy Spirit in transforming us and life in the Spirit. Chapter 12, be transformed by the renewal of your mind. That helpful, uh, hopeful message that the Spirit transforms us, our minds are renewed, we become a living sacrifice, and our living sacrifice life is is having this this good life, being good citizens, being a good example to the world of how people should be, being transformed and renewed people who love and who live in harmony with one another. And that's what we're going to look at in 14 verse 1 to 15 verse 6. And then uh, we'll get next week, I think we might be able to finish the whole of the book of Romans and talk about what's what's next. So we carry on in the book of Romans as we read from chapter 14. Welcome those who are weak in the faith, but not for the purpose of quarreling over opinions. Some believe in eating anything, while the weak eat only vegetables. Those who eat must not despise those who abstain, and those who abstain must not pass judgment on those who eat, for God has welcomed them. Who are you to pass judgment on servants of another? It is before their own Lord that they stand or fall, and they will be upheld, for the Lord is able to make them stand. Some judge one day to be better than another, while others judge all days to be alike. Let all be fully convinced in their own minds. Those who observe the day, observe it in honor of the Lord. Also, those who eat, eat in honor of the Lord, since they give thanks to God. While those who abstain, abstain in honor of the Lord and give thanks to God. These are important passages, especially in these times, about learning to, to live with differences to understand each other, to care for each other as different as we each may be. And so, oops, I'm pressing the wrong buttons here. Ta-da. What does Paul mean about those who are weak in the faith? And, and uh, the person who described in this context um, from the Bible, New Bible Commentary is not necessarily one who is immature or lacking in faith in Christ in an absolute sense. Rather, he or she is one who does not believe that his Christian faith allows him to engage in some specific practice. So, uh, someone who is excessively scrupulous or delicate. And so, this is quite an interesting thing because those who are may, perhaps more legalistic would normally regard themselves as stronger, but Paul is saying that those who are more legalistic are weaker and um, that those who are, are strong in faith and are a bit more liberal in their choices should treat the others a bit, with a bit more respect. And that's quite an interesting uh, perspective, a different way of looking at things. So, so. So those who are more legalistic tend, I guess, because of the nature of being legalistic, to be a bit more self-righteous, maybe. Um, but he's saying to those who might be feeling a bit self-righteous, uh, you're the weak ones, um, and saying to those who are perhaps a little uh, less self-righteous and more dependent on Christ for their righteousness because they're aware that they're, they're not keeping all the laws and doing all the right things, that they can, maybe that's a funny way of putting it, so don't take it too far, um, would be a little bit more humble in their opinion. It also might also refer to the fact that there are less people who are, are um, so it's a weak group rather than a strong group. So there's a, a, a small group of people who have a certain opinion, and he's saying to the strong group of people, the bigger group of people, be patient with those who have a different opinion to you. Now, in the world that we live in, we uh, get on Facebook, and Facebook wants us to engage. So Facebook will, if you're into a conspiracy theory, if you think that Bill Gates gave this app to Android to put on your phone so that you can be tracked and traced, uh, then you share something about that. Facebook will show you more about that because Facebook wants to make you excited. And it's not actually a person that makes the decision. And You should watch The, um, the Social Dilemma. It's a, a, a something on Netflix about how, how these... Um, social media type things work because they they have computers that drive engagement they they have no moral compass at all all they want to do is see you on on their apps more and more and more and so the more they see you on the apps the more th- that you continue so they'll continue to share nonsense with you in order to keep you there and eventually you'll think that the world agrees with your nonsense because you're not being exposed to different ideas so that's the social media bubble but what's interesting here is that 
that the Jews had a, a, a in terms of their food laws had a way of dividing themselves from the rest of the community, especially in these new uh, Gentile settlements where they would go live because of their strict dietary laws, because of their strict Sabbath laws, because of, of their strict rules about associating with one another in various villages and places. There's evidence that Jews would tend to live in their own section and kind of to separate themselves through, um, through their food and diet. And so now we're talking about trying to get Gentiles and Jews to eat together. And so uh, from the Dictionary of Paul and his letters, it's a very helpful uh, commentary. Jewish identity was in no small measure determined how food was repair, prepared, what sort of foods were and were not eaten, and with whom one ate or did not eat. Now this is interesting because in our culture, in, in South Africa today, you've got uh, perhaps spicy Indian type food, you've got... I mean, you can you can look at a dining room table and perhaps tell the the nationhood of the of the, the group that's eating at the table. If there's pup or if there's uh, roast potato, or if there's uh, uh, afal or et cetera, et cetera, everything's different, and so we eat differently because we are different cultures. And it it really is quite hard to teach ourselves to eat things that that we're not used to eating in order to get on with people differently. And also we get confused about how to, what's, you know, what's the custom here? If I'm invited to, to the birthday party of somebody who's of a different culture from me, what is expected? Or if I invite somebody from a different culture to, to have a birthday party with me, what are they expecting? You know, some cultures think that a bring and bry is offensive. Why must I come to your house and bring my own food? Uh, and other cultures think a bring and bry is a good idea. So we all have to work these things out and work out how to eat together. And so the early Christians in the yellow highlighting ate meals together, and with their early identity with and emerges from Judaism came questions about the appropriateness and necessity of these food laws for followers of Christ. So the Jews said this kind of food was okay, others said no. So as... Uh, these communities would meet in houses, when they eventually grew too big to meet in houses, food preparation was too much and they would meet in a hall and dining facilities were no longer required. And so they would meet in a hall or a basilica, a church, and it was more appropriate for the growing number of Christians. But as we meet on a Sunday morning, as we hope to do soon, we know that that brings us out of our households and keeps us from fellowshipping with one another in our differences. And even as we fellowship on a Sunday morning, we end up worshipping in one language later and another language earlier. And even as we divide into our Bible studies and groups, we, we don't force people to, to associate and we separate according to language and preference. And we don't do enough of the breaking down of the barriers that exist between us in terms of our cultures. And so... The meals within the context of Christian house gatherings, the, uh, I think Meeks writes, uh, can be seen as an overt manifestation of reconciliation between the Jews and Gentiles in Christ. And uh, highlighted there, Pauline, in yellow, Pauline Christians gave up one of the most effective ways by which the Jewish community had maintained its separate identity in the pagan society. So this new change of eating with people who are different to you was extremely nerve-wracking for people who, who, who had to make it uh, because one of the things that we hold on to almost sacredly is our culture. So don't touch us on our culture, we'll get upset. And we sometimes hold culture up above our faith as a defining thing, saying that I'm, I'm, I'm this before I am that so to speak, and we shouldn't really do that, should we? So food matters, and the house church was the venue for the cultural disestablishment which was necessary for the founding of the church in a Jewish Gentile milieu. So that house church culture literally broke down the divisions between Jews and Gentiles. And as we continue in South Africa today, with all of our divisions and our differences, we need to learn how to eat together how to cross those boundaries, how to eat. Uh, if you don't like chicken feet, you should try them. If you, you know, uh, if you don't like seafood, you should try that. If you don't like curry, you should try that. Change up your diet a little bit. Get to know different people. And also perhaps we need to learn not to be so scared to ask, hey, what's expected of me? 
uh, in this kind of context and, and make sure that we have those conversations that are needed in order to change our opinions. But in the time of Paul, these questions were, were religious questions. People had died refusing to eat pork. So in the books of the Maccabees, which is just fascinating context, which is if you've got a Bible with an Apocrypha, which is the, the books between the Old Testament and the New Testament, you read Maccabees, you'll see that people were, were almost forced to eat pork and, and, and there's stories there of martyrs being fried in giant pans, I mean really fried, um, for, for refusing to betray their religion because the Greeks wanted to force Greek culture onto the nations that they colonized. Uh, the Romans were a bit more careful and clever. They kind of uh, opted for an assimilation. But in the time of the Greek domination of, of Israel, um, it was deeply offensive to the Jews that, that people were running naked in, in athletics events and, and there were all of these Greek cultural innovations being made. So, new change. Here's this group of people doing things differently. Some people are looking down on others because they eat, uh, let's say they eat bacon, or because they have different opinion about various laws from the Old Testament. Paul is saying to them, who are you to pass judgment on servants of another? And that question, who matters? Do you matter so much that you get to decide how other people ought to behave? Or does God matter so much that God gets to decide how other people people behave. And so in yellow highlighting there in verse 4, it is before their own Lord that they stand or fall. And they will be upheld, for the Lord is able to make them stand. So Paul appeals to the conscience of these believers in their understanding of the faith that they have, that they have been saved by God's grace, and know that they, they are in good relationship with God, and they can carry on doing what they do in good conscience. And Paul invites us to trust one another a little more about our decisions, about our behavior, and our understandings of who God is and who we are and what God requires of us. And so in this whole section of chapter 14, 1 to 15, verse 13, is this um, expectation that Christians should love each other deeply, and as the New Interpreter's Study Bible puts it, uh, the strong and weak refer to faith, not to character or abilities. And Paul does not commend the strong over the weak, but condemns the judgments of both. And that's a reminder to us not to um, think of ourselves as uh, we're so strong in our faith we can do anything or, or to, to further divide ourselves over our opinions, but rather to, to be united in our love for one another. And this uh, principle of not judging has its basis back in, say, Matthew chapter 7. Do not judge so that you may not be judged. For with the judgment you make, you will be judged, and the measure you give will be the measure you get. Why do you see the speck in your neighbor's eye, but do not notice the log in your own eye? Now, we all think that we see the logs in our own eyes, and, and we pay no attention to anybody else. But truly and honestly, each of us has a higher, probably a better opinion of ourselves in some way or other, than we should. And so we often don't see our faults. We only see the faults of others. And if we learn not to be so picky that we always just only see our faults, but if we learn to be kind and generous in the way that we see one another and that we treat ourselves and treat others, because sometimes if you judge yourself too harshly, you end up judging everybody else. Or if you gossip so much about others, you end up thinking that everybody else is talking about you, but you only think that because you talk about everybody else, etc., etc. If you don't, always looking for the specks in people's eyes, you might find that uh, you have a better opinion of yourself and uh, a better relationship with others. So Jesus says in verse 5 of chapter 7, first take the log out of your own eye, and then you'll see clearly to take the speck out of your neighbor's eye. I mean, that's just one of the classics of Jesus and such an important uh, scripture for us all to, to know and to believe. We also read in John chapter 5 uh, about who does the judging. Just as the Father has life in himself, so he's granted the Son also to have life in himself, and he has given him authority to execute judgment because he is the Son of Man. It's Jesus who does all the judging. Uh, 
and then also a parallel in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, for all of us must appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each may receive recompense for what has been done in the body, whether good or evil. Each of us stand before the judgment seat of Christ. We don't need to judge one another, but we do need to be accountable and helpful. Here's a, a, a sort of graphical representation from the Faith Life Study Bible of what a judgment seat looks like. And this is uh, in the comments. And by the way, the Faith Life Study Bible is a, a free-ish app on, uh, on uh, your phone or even on your computer, I think. And it gives you some great commentary and some great uh, images and things, maps and things to look at. The reason it's free is that they they it's from the... I'm not sure what it's called. I use the software called Logos Library Software, and they sell lots of books, uh, electronic versions, and all of my books are electronic. So the Faith Life Study Bible has links in it to books that you could buy to expand your studies, um, and those could get pretty expensive. So what I've done is over the years, I've sort of subscribed and, and built up a collection that I can use, that I've got most of my dictionaries and commentaries, but it is quite pricey, uh, to buy some of those books if they're just on their own but there are some wonderful books there so the faith life study bible you can download the app on your ipad or on your on your laptop i think or on your cell phone and it's a very helpful commentary anyway images here are a graphical representation of a kind of judgment seat and can you imagine standing before god at that judgment seat up there at the top i'm going to try and point uh judgment seat oh, my finger fell off there um up there and uh, standing before God and God exposing all of your sins and laying out the case against you. You have to stand on your own before God, not uh, not anybody else. And you don't have to uh, speak up for anybody else or judge them before God has that responsibility of judging them at the time. So Paul speaks to us about each living according to our conscience. Some judge one day to be better than another, while others judge all days to be alike. And I like that in verse 5. Let all be fully convinced in their own minds. So when somebody gives us a different argument to what we believe is right, um, we don't have to change our opinions. But we do, I think, owe to ourselves to check our opinions. To, to say, okay, well, I've decided that I must do this or live in such and such a way or I can decide to do this and that. Christ gives us the, the freedom to make our own decisions, to, to discern what is right and what is wrong. We have to be able to stand before God with those decisions. And so we have to really examine our conscience and our understanding of things in order to, to, to make our own decisions. And we each need to respect other people's rights to make decisions about how they live, if it doesn't harm us, if it doesn't hurt us, or, or hurt anybody else around them, and and respect them in their differences. In this case, it's about eating and abstaining and, and various things. In other cases, it might be quite different. So this is a principle that, that Paul perhaps offers to us about how to live in unity across differences of opinion. And so there's some who believe that this is how you should read Scripture, and there's others who believe that that's how you should read Scripture. Some who subscribe to this or that doctrine, or, or they have understandings of life and relationships that are different to you. Respect their opinions. This is what the Scripture teaches us to do. Respect their, their ideas, because they have to stand before God to, to make that declaration. And that helps us to stand together as a community across our divisions and differences. We don't have to condemn others or judge others for their different ways of doing things. And that's a bit of a pity because most of us, even if you'll see churches saying we're a non-denominational church or a, a, a multi-denominational church, you'll find that every church has some sort of statement of faith or belief that, that points them out as a certain denomination or something. So I'd rather be a denominational church that says this is what we stand for and this is what we, we think. We don't think this because we think we're better than everybody else. We think this because we've we've all agreed that that's the way we should be. But perhaps we should be a little more multi-denominational in our thinking 
in allowing each other to live and let live and, and have some freedom of conscience. So in the Faith Life Study Bible, a comment on being fully convinced in his own mind, Paul emphasizes that each person must operate with a clear conscience, regardless of his or her practice. Elsewhere, Paul advises believers not to let others judge them with regard to special days. So other people might have different opinions of you, and you might have your opinion. And this is the problem with the way the world is. If you share your opinion, sometimes you'll be thinking, I'm going to share what I think about this or that. And then you think, I oh, know everybody's going to jump down my throat. That's, that's how it is. Uh, in the world today, and we actually need to be different. We need to be people who are not going to jump down other people's throats because they've got different opinions as we try and sort of prove ourselves to be the ones who are right and others are wrong. Don't you like the way my head disappears a bit when I go up too high? <laughs> Anyways. And so this uh, this thing that we're supposed to have, oh, that's a big Greek word that I'm not even going to try to say, but this word for for being convinced, to be absolutely sure, to be certain, to have complete certainty. So this, the certainty is also related to uh, a faith uh, belief that God is able to judge us and judge us rightly according to our beliefs. And so all of this is about how we, how we are not about ourselves, but about God. And we do not live to ourselves, we do not die to ourselves. If we live, we live to the Lord. If we die, we die to the Lord. Whether we live or die, we are the Lord's. So a reminder to whom we belong. And then it continues, Why do you despise your brother or sister? For we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. And a, a verse from Isaiah, As I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me. And every tongue shall give praise to God. So we need to think very carefully about the decisions we make and the things that we do. Because we know that we will have to give an account to God in the end all of those things. In the NRV version of that verse 12, so then each of us will give an account of himself to God. A reminder that we each have to speak up for ourselves. So perhaps uh, we imagine that, that we stand before God and God says, why are you so mean to that person? Or why are you so mean to your child? Or, or this or that. And we could stand up and say, hey, but the Bible says this. And God will say, but why do you think that that verse of the Bible is more important than this verse of the Bible? And you'd have to actually give an account of yourself for, for why you do what you do or what opinions you hold against other opinions. It's up to you. But what about accountability? There is a strong sense in the Scriptures of actually calling others to order in the Christian community. My brothers and sisters, if any one of you among if anyone among you wanders from the truth and is brought back by another, you should know that whoever brings back a sinner from wandering will save the sinner's soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. But the question is about how you be somebody who brings somebody back from wandering, wandering from the truth, or, or what you think is, is truth and, and how you hold that. So you could actually be so opinionated and so so arrogant in your opinion that you chase people further away. Or you could be somebody who's reasonable, who's able to present a solid argument and win other people back. James commends us for being people who are able to win other people back rather than chase others away. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, this advice to Timothy, have nothing to do with stupid and senseless controversies. You know they breed quarrels. The Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but be kindly to everyone, an apt teacher, patient, correcting opponents with gentleness. Isn't that a beautiful description of the way that we should teach and the way that we should argue and the way that we should debate? And so often the debates that we have in our churches descend into this name-calling and this you're a sinner and, and you're not saved and we are saved and we're better than you and God's, God's going to judge you and all of those those things that we descend to, but this beautiful, these beautiful words from Second Timothy chapter two, twenty three and twenty four, not quarrelsome but kindly to everyone, an apt teacher, patient, correcting opponents with gentleness. These hopes of winning people back or winning people's opinions through through kindness and gentleness, and with that humble gentleness 
as a teacher or as a as as a, a, a servant of the Lord, perhaps you'll learn something too. If you consider the debate from another person's perspective or another person's experience, you are able to change your own ideas. And that's not a bad thing because we are, are people who are born with brains and we're able to to consider arguments and to to learn and grow together. But there are more harsh words. Uh, so there's this argument for being together, but in some cases there are are things where 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 people are to to kind of uh, it's hard words um, to be excluded from the community. And that I mean we understand that that in these Christian communities there can be abuse. There can be people who take advantage of your faith and of your religion in order to overwhelm you and 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 destroy you or sometimes just communities are destroyed by by one or two people who who press their opinion above everybody else and so there is room in the scriptures for speaking up and saying you better change but this is an interesting passage in 1 Corinthians chapter 5 from verse 11 about about how you associate with people within the body of Christ who behave in in unacceptable ways and how you behave with people who are outside of the body of Christ who behave in acceptable in unacceptable ways. But now I'm tra- writing to you, says Paul, not to associate with anyone who bears the name of brother or sister, so anyone in the community who is sexually immoral or greedy or is an idolater, reviler, reviler drunkard, or, or robber. So all of these, these things saying that within the Christian community, maybe if somebody is boasting about all of their immorality or their greed, uh, their drunkenness. So a drunkard is different to an alcoholic, sort of somebody who who celebrates their their thievery and all of their their illegal activity. You should avoid those people, um, says Paul. Don't even eat with them. You know. So he's saying that there is a line that needs to be drawn because you could influence each other negatively. But Paul says, what have I to do with judging those outside? Remember Jesus. He. He ate with those who were outside of the community and he brought them in with his love and his generosity. It, is it not those who are inside that you are to judge? Judge is not about you being God and judging them, but about us being critical and about us making decisions about who we associate with and how we associate with them so that we don't bring each other down. God will judge those outside. But, says Paul, drive out the wicked person from among you. Uh, and that should never be something that is taken lightly. I know in the Methodist Church of Southern Africa, if there is a charge against someone because they continue to to cause trouble, there are systems of accountability in terms of, of laying out that charge, explaining the problem, presenting to neutral people what the issues are, following all of those guidelines of Scripture of, of allowing all the words to be heard, uh, seeking reconciliation and 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 uh, consensus on a way forward, but only as a last resort, saying to somebody, "Listen, rather rather not." We, you, you know, that that a bishop or or someone who's reviewed all of the procedures would be able to say, um, "Perhaps you should uh, leave the community," but then there's that that continued pursuit of those saying you're welcome to come back anytime just think about uh, jesus and the way that he that he uh, tells the story about the prodigal son when the prodigal son returns he is not asked to undergo a time of probation or a time of trial or anything like that he gets a robe put on him a ring on his finger and he is part of the family so much part of the family that the big brother says hey what about me but that is the way of Christ and perhaps the way that the church should be in terms of loving each other and walking with each other. Therefore, let us not pass judgment on one another, but resolve instead never to put a stumbling block or hindrance in the way of another. Remember that sometimes the opinions that you hold, that you defend to the hilt, that you say, I'm right and others are wrong, could actually make other people not believe because you say that you insist on believing in 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 this unscientific and faith perspective in terms of uh, uh, creation or history or things like that 
And then others would say, well, I can't believe if that's the truth. And and you actually need to hold your uh, opinions humbly because everybody who thinks that their opinions are wrong will have different opinions. So don't judge others and, and put stumbling blocks in front of them to st- cause others to stumble. It would be better to have a millstone tied around your neck. I am... I know and am persuaded in the Lord Jesus that nothing is unclean in itself, that it is unclean for anyone who thinks it is unclean. If your brother or sister is being injured by what you eat, you are no longer walking in love. Do not let what you eat cause the ruin of one for whom Christ died. So there are non-essentials that you might insist that others hold as the same as you, and Paul is saying that, that you are wrong. Do not let your good be spoken of as evil. For the kingdom of God is not food and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. The ultimate result of the kingdom of God is not all of these these legal aspects and these details, but rather the righteousness, which is justice, which is a good relationship with God, which is peace, which is, is, uh, um, you know, that peace is a, a big word to explain, but that that sense of satisfaction and love in knowing God and joy in the Holy Spirit, this overflowing joy and love. And all of these things are what the kingdom of God is about, not about rule-keeping and and judging one another and bringing each other down. The one who thus serves Christ is acceptable to God and has human approval. Let us then pursue what makes for peace and for mutual upbuilding. Do not for the sake of food destroy the work of God, Everything is indeed clean, but it is wrong for you to make others fall by what you eat. So this is about what they were eating and about food offered to idols, as we would read in, in Corinthians. But, but it's more than that, we understand. It is good not to eat meat uh, or drink wine or do anything that makes your brother or sister stumble. The faith that you have, have as your own conviction before God. Blessed are those who have no reason to condemn themselves because of what they approve. But those who have doubts are condemned if they eat because they do not act from faith. For whatever does not proceed from faith is sin. Really hard words from Paul, but important words for us to consider and adopt as our own faith in terms of our relationship with other and our acceptance of people having different opinions to us and knowing that we're not the ones who will judge them in the end, but God is the one. And also of accepting different opinions to the ones that we hold because we must learn by hearing and changing our ideas in order to grow towards that day when God might interrogate us and say, why did you do that? Why did you believe that? How come? Don't you believe in me? Did you trust me? Put our trust in God and God alone and in his love. From the Wesley Study Bible, uh, in an individualistic, materialistic culture, self-absorption rather than concern for others can become the norm for decision-making. Wesley defined a stumbling block as the act of moving others, even against their conscience, to do as we do which causes causes others to hate or judge themselves. God calls us to put others first. The self-emptying and self-giving attitude that makes our love genuine and convincing. This call challenges us to reflect on the notion that our love for God and others transcends our legal rights and personal claims. It is a balancing act of limiting our freedom and rights in being responsible to others' well-being. So within the Methodist Church, we have a tradition of being teetotalers, not because we believe that that alcohol is supremely evil and terrible, but because we see that that our drinking or our uh, drunkenness or having alcohol at church events could result in others stumbling and falling. And so we make changes in the way that we live, in the way that we we practice life, so that so that we can be inclusive rather than exclusive. We who are strong ought to put up with the failings of the weak, not to please ourselves. Each of us must please our neighbor for the good purpose of building up the neighbor. 
That's an important verse because we live in a culture of saying you mustn't please others, you must please yourself, remember who you are. So that's important that you don't become a doormat whose identity is trampled under the feet of others. But also that you don't fall for the cultural um, habit of, of being, being yourself at others' expense. Christ did not please himself, but as it is written, the insults of those who insult you have fallen on me. For whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction, so that by steadfastness and by the encouragement of the Scriptures we might have hope. May the God of steadfastness and encouragement grant you to live in harmony with one another in accordance with Christ Jesus, so that together you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And so, loving God, we ask that you would help us to be united across our differences and that each of the opinions that we hold, each of the things that we do, we do because we trust that they are right before you, that we'd be able to give thanks and trust in you in all our decisions and our life choices. So, show us how to be merciful and kind and gentle in our opinions and help us where we have fallen back or where others have fallen away to win each other back to you for the sake of your love and in the name of Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. Thank you for joining us and uh, thank you St. Paul for your wonderful writing. He's still so busy writing he doesn't talk to me. I keep myself right there. Uh, so have a good evening, uh, good morning or good day, whatever. I look forward to seeing you on Sunday as we continue to work through uh, Exodus, and I look forward to being able to share with you some more news about how we might be able to open sooner than sooner than we we thought. And uh, please carry on being responsible, carry on staying safe, so that life can get back to normal. And uh, as we hold things up, pray for one another for God's blessing and God's help in all the things that we do. Amen. <laughs>